is Mr. Rowe. I am the host of Reality Extraction, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I utilize logic, intellect, and magic to methodically autonomize, vivisect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday, 1700 hours Pacific Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's reality extraction with Mr. Rowe on Revolution Radio. Yeah, I hear static. I imagine it's still going. Yeah, it's not. Can I start this is Thomas, I'm a.k.a. Mad Painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to well, bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. I'll bring an open mind to an open canvas. Part. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You up government corruption. Uh-huh. This is Revolution Radio. Uh-huh. Freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we are listener sponsored and commercial free, but there still are bills to pay. In order to raise some needed funds to cover the cost, our station is offering a silver special. In the continental United States for a $60 donation, or in Alaska, Hawaii, or Canada for a $70 donation, we will send you an uncirculated 2018 one ounce pure silver eagle. The $70 donation, uh, the extra 10 is to cover shipping, by the way, outside of the continental United States. When making the donation, you must put Silver Eagle promo in the notes on the donation. And thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at revolution.radio and freedomslips.com. Without you, there is no less. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Back, back, back. Schedule will be on Revolution Radio every Saturday night, 6 to 8 p.m. You get outer space. You get honest answers, real researchers, truthful answers, and a place to engage with questions. Take part in the discussion. Revolution Radio on FreedomSlips.com hosts Collision Course every Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. It happens more often than we can imagine. In my case, I was sitting at home, and out of nowhere, I just started feeling uncomfortable. Then it got worse, and I started perspiring. I tried to ignore it, but I waited too long. The chest pain came as we were driving to the hospital emergency. I felt my life clock begin to tick. I barely survived. There was lots of damage done to my heart. What do I do now? I was lucky. I took a leap of faith and tried a seven-herb formula with hawthorn, garlic, cayenne, and more called Extendivite. Herbs have been used for thousands of years to keep us healthy. If you're not using Extendivite as a preventative supplement, Maybe it's time to start. To order, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extend Your The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host.
Aloha. <laughs> I guess we're not going to have our uh, lead-in intro today, but uh, your host, Janet Kira Lesson, and my co-host is Dr. Sasha Alec Lesson, and this is Stargate the Cosmos on Revolution Radio at revolution.radio. Our producer is Thomas Becker, also known as a mad painter, and our guest today is Maria Wheatley. And Maria has studied Neolithic Britain and Bronze Age prehistory at Bath and Oxford University. Along with other professionals, Maria combines her knowledge of archaeology and earth energies with state-of-the-art equipment to detect and interpret the hidden frequencies of the earth. She is an expert on locating and analyzing earth energies at sacred sites across Europe. She runs esotericcollege.com which offers certified courses on holistic subjects, including past life regression, druid soul, star astrology, tarot, and dowsing. And Maria teaches advanced dowsing techniques, techniques which are not taught anywhere else in the world. And I have a longer bio for Maria on AquarianRadio.com. And we're going to be talking about uh, Stonehenge and all of the stone circles and different um Things that you see all throughout the world, especially over there in the UK. Her latest book is called The Secret History of Stonehenge, Oracle of the Gods. And we'll find a connection between the circles and the gods of ancient. And Maria is a featured presenter at the 2019 Contact in the Desert event, which is in, um, oh, what's that called? It's in California. I will pull up that information. So before we bring on Maria, um, like to bring on Dr. Sasha, Alec, listen, buddy, can you give yes, us a I, Are you hello, there? Aloha. I am indeed here, and um, I'm, I'm uh, the, a student of Zachariah Sitchin's, and uh, basically what he uh, researched and uh, said was that after Ra, or Marduk, uh, drove Ningishita, Toth, uh, from, uh, after 300 years of war, uh, from Egypt, uh, Enki, uh, and Thoth went to both UK and to Ireland and that they contributed to some of the building of the Stonehenge. And so that's, and I wonder, and then I've seen other, totally other accounts like William Henry's account of how Stonehenge got there. And there's, there's so many different stories. So that's one thing I really want to question you about. The other one that, totally fascinates me is uh, the idea that uh, after uh, Marduk was in uh, basically in charge of the um, eastern Mediterranean after the nuking of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, Nimah had goddess culture was all over and it was peaceful and it culminated in Minoan civilization and uh, and uh, so I'm really interested in that movement especially archaeologically uh, between what happened to the goddess culture and partnership and the possibilities that we had and and where are we at now stuff like that welcome Maria hi thanks for having me so um, I you are very knowledgeable and I don't know exactly where to start so how about you start with the um, what's most current and hot for you on the research and what you're bringing to the conference, and then we'll interject in about 15, 20 minutes or so with some questions. Right, okay. Well, it's really exciting for, to go to Contact in the Desert and uh, to America to speak about, you know, things uh, in the U.K., so what I've been looking at uh, in the UK, what I'm known for over here, is discovering the long-skulled people of Stonehenge uh, in the very early Neolithic period, which is about sort of 5,000 years ago, and their sort of long-lost history of how they were basically wiped out by the Bronze Age culture. It seems that there was a big conflict going on uh, in the UK. So I look at the people behind the monuments as much as the monuments themselves. And if we go to, for example, 17 miles to the north of Stonehenge, we have the world's largest stone circle called Avebury Henge. And they're, they're connected on straight lines, which we call lays, or which in America you call ley lines. And there's a, a lot of 
blaze of associated with earth currents that entwine them. So in the UK, we look at lay systems as much as lay lines. So we think of a, a lay that is in, entwined with two earth currents. One is male and one is female. And these earth currents are really the power in the land. And they were sought after by Chinese geomants and, you know, feng shui experts. So I look at the land, what's the, the hidden frequencies uh, in the land and the monuments themselves. And I also have been trained by European master dowsers to look at the colour frequencies of lays and earth energies that were known to the ancient Egyptians and they created certain types of pendulums that could resonate with particular earth colour frequencies known as the Isis pendulum, the Karnak pendulum and the Osiris pendulum. So I work with uh, earth energies, with their colours and their frequencies and the people behind the monuments as well. Wow. So you're saying that there's elongated skull people... I know we see them all through South America. Do you, do you, they have found uh, people with long skulls and they're allowing them to come out? The, the, in, well, that's museums, right. I mean, uh, uh, Brian Forrester is very famous for, uh, you know, talking about and discovering the Paracas long skulls in South America. And I've taken Brian around Stonehenge and Avebury Henge. And what wasn't known really by mainstream archaeologists was who built the first monuments in the UK known as the Neolithic monuments going back 5,000, 5,500 years ago. And I got drawn to study particular long barrows and what long barrows are in the UK and across Northwest Europe. They're called burial chambers, but a bit like, you know, the the Great Pyramid, they're not burial chambers. They were, first of all, used for temple space, initiation, and, and probably other things beside on a quite ceremonial basis. And then they were used to, you know, house the skulls and the long bones. So that that's long barrows. And they're, they're, they could be massive monuments around about sort of 300 feet long, and they have internal chambers, a bit like caves uh, in a way. So these long barrows were scattered around all of northwest uh, Europe. And I noticed that one long barrow around Stonehenge was the largest in northwest Europe. It was huge. It was about 400 feet long in an estimation. So I thought, well, normally in uh, Europe, you have a communal burial deposits in these long barrows up to sometimes 50 people but in this particular barrow it was for one person and one person alone and that person was a woman in antiquarian reports so I thought well I'll look into who this person was and track down the skull to Cambridge University and discovered when I looked at it it was a long skulled person it did not have a skull like ours and this was kept from the general public so I began to popularize and discuss the fact that the Neolithic people of ancient Britain had different skulls to us wow Tosh question comment Okay, uh, I'm not, I'm not on mute on Janet anymore. Um, uh, thank you. That's, that's utterly uh, fascinating. What else do you know about the Neolithic people and, and, and what they were doing? Well, it seems that the Neolithic women have a name. Did they have a name for the woman? Was there any, um, like we, they found, um, Princess Puabi. Where did they find Princess Puabi? Uh, Sash, where was she found? Uh, uh, Lagash, yeah. Uh, Lagash, Lagash. Lagash. She apparently ended up in the London Museum in the basin. basin. So we know that they, they hide them. And she had uh, a different shaped skull. I don't know if it's quite elongated or there's some that have, a, you know, longer skulls than others. Did you get to see her skull? Yeah, I requested a, a visit to do an academic paper because uh, I study archaeology so I could have access to uh, the skull because, you know, uh, in 
particular universities in the UK that are quite prestigious, you have to write an academic paper to view these type of skulls. So, you know, fortuitously, I was uh, in the loop, so to speak. So when I, I, I looked at the, the skull, I realized that it was a very long skull person. And I began to, you know, look into the nature of these people and their monuments. And what I discovered was they were very short people. They weren't tall at all because around the skulls were found long bones of like, you know, the, the thigh. And once you have that long bone, you can ascertain quite easily through a mathematical formula how tall the person was. I mean, anthropologists and the police use this formula to ascertain the height of a person. So the females were about five feet tall and the males were about five, four uh, to about five, eight tops. So they were quite short. They were very robust. They were quite, you know, muscular in their, their physique. And their ears were slightly more behind where our ears are today. And their teeth were quite small as well. So it seems that they could have been a, a literally a different race of humanity that were building some of the most enigmatic monuments in the, the UK because when we look at Stonehenge we must realize that the Stonehenge that we're all so familiar with and we think that we know was a monument that was built over a thousand years it, it, it's not a monument that just uh, appeared in the landscape in one period so if we're looking at that timeline that's like me looking back a thousand years ago to 1066 when it was a medieval Britain and trying to relate to that. So when we look at Stonehenge, we really need to think about lots of different cultures adding to that monument and dismantling some stone settings and putting different stone settings in to create the Stonehenge that we're familiar with. And phase one Stonehenge was a stone circle of 56 blue stones that came from Wales, around about 120 miles away, and it was set within a henge. And a henge is a ditch and a bank with a large chalk bank or a wall that surrounded it. So imagine now a sort of uh, a six to a, a nine foot wall of chalk white chalk and inside of which you have a stone circle of 56 blue stones that's Stonehenge phase one and that was developed by the long skulled people in front of Stonehenge in that Neolithic phase was a massive monument called the Cursors which the long skulled people constructed and a Cursors monument that stood in front of Stonehenge had chalk walls up to six to nine feet tall and it stretched for nearly two miles across the landscape with just um, maybe one entrance but it was huge uh, kind of like a, a long elongated monument which was almost kind of rectangular in shape so some of these monuments don't exist anymore because they were plowed out a bit like some of your american sites in ohio and elsewhere they were just you know plowed out to make way for the railways so when we look back to the neolithic britain we see some of the most ancient monuments that were constructed by the long skulled people that include long barrows and cursors monuments <coughs> so how much did those stones weigh how did they move them well the blue stones of phase one weigh about four tons each the <coughs> sarsin stones of phase two stonehenge weigh a lot more uh, and you know enter you know they're like a hundred tons or more <coughs> <clears throat> for some of the features and it's a it's a really kind of enigma how they were moved i'm sure that the the earth energies in the landscape 
associated to some of the, the lay systems contributed to moving the stones because wherever you have earth currents you have ancient sites and I, I'm I think the two are related a lot of people uh, most recently think sound was involved which I'm sure that it was but I also think there was a long lost technology that we're only beginning to understand that allowed the stones to become maybe a little bit lighter and easy to to maneuver. But one thing we know for sure about the Bronze Age and the Neolithic periods is to the ancient ancestors, moving stone was not a problem because they were moving stone all over the world. Right. Interesting. Um, Sasha, your turn. Uh, yeah, I, I find that in the places I study too, and, and also uh, in places like Ankarvat. They had methods of, uh, of making stone, pouring it, basically pouring it into molds. Uh, we have something like that. We can create something called greens with greens gas, where we can uh, do that with rocks too. So uh, that's uh, that's always part of the question: was were these uh, and not? But you've got a place in the Wales, and it's a long distance, and uh, it's quite a mystery. That's right. I mean, some of the blue stones, uh, they came from, from Wales in a place called Kando, Kangodog and Carmeni. They've actually sourced the exact quarry where they came from. And they were a very beautiful, beautiful type of stone. They were highly polished. And imagine now that you have a blue stone. Uh, dark blue flexed with white uh, felspar looking like the star spangled sky that's the blue stone and that was sourced mm. from wales for stonehenge then we look at the kind of stonehenge that we're familiar with today that is the outer stone circle of 30 large standing stones with lintels on the top came from the Marlborough Downs, not far from where I live, actually, and they were the silver type of stones. But we're seeing Stonehenge after 4,000, and that's if we use orthodox dating, 4,000 years of weathering. They were highly polished and would have looked really a beautiful silver colour than the altar stone at Stonehenge was a particular type of green sandstone that was flexed with red garnet. So we've lost the colouring system of Stonehenge because of uh, weathering. But back in the day of the Bronze Age, it would have been a real sight and a, a, a wonder to behold. It would have had the blue stones, silver stones, and at the holiest of holiest, at the, uh, at the centre of Stonehenge, a beautiful, large 16 foot green sandstone flecks with red garnet that's Stonehenge wow. was there anything incised or uh, in uh, a relief on on the stones or were they polished flat there, they were polished uh, quite quite flat there wasn't really anything left at Stonehenge but Elizabethan antiquarians that's going back to the 1500s uh, in UK history they went to Stonehenge and they recorded that there was a, a kind of what they described as a tablet which is like a large piece of metal that was inscribed with very strange symbols that was found close to Stonehenge but that artifact has long long gone so what was that? The scholars of the day, they knew Latin, they knew different languages, you know, <laughs> it was, you know, quite sophisticated in the Elizabethan period, really. So they couldn't decipher these symbols. It could have been, for example, some kind of different uh, culture or race that wrote this tablet onto the uh, metal, or it could have been a form of what we call oum, which is ancient Druid writing. But without the artifact there, you could say it came from outer space, it came from the people. It, it's long lost. So uh, a lot of information about Stonehenge has been lost. And in my own research, what I noticed about Stonehenge, if indeed this uh, long lost metal tablet existed, on one of the trilithons, and that's the 
in a horseshoe shape at Stonehenge has gigantic trilithons there, two standing stones with a lintel on top of them, and there's five on, in the centre of Stonehenge. One of those trilithons had a very large rectangular shape carved on it that could have fitted the tablet, the metal tablet, upon it cannot be uh, ruled out. We think we know Stonehenge, but we actually know very little. And what we do know about Stonehenge has come through an archaeological model, mainly done since the 1900s and the 1960s. So in my forthcoming book, I mean, I've written other books, I've written Divine and Ancient Sites and uh, the Essential Dowsing Guide, but in my forthcoming book about the long-skulled people, I questioned the actual model of Stonehenge. Did it really look like that? And that's what I think we need to understand, that we're just spoon-fed a particular vision about what people think Stonehenge looked like. Was there uh, ever a ceiling on it? Was there a, a, a cover well, that's a good question, but I don't think so because some of the easiest deposits to find at an ancient site are water deposits and fire deposits. They leave carbon and they leave a kind of residue called uh, alluvium. And if you've got a roof on uh, a monument, you're going to have water spillage coming off and no water spillage has been discovered at Stonehenge. So it's highly unlikely that it was roofed. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Well, has anyone done any of the DNA studies on the remains, and how do they, if they did, how do they compare with the um, other long stone beings, like in South America? Yes, well, there's been some DNA studies from the uh, Paracas skulls, which associates them with the with the steps uh, heading towards uh, Russia. There has been no DNA testing in the UK, although I've recently requested some uh, DNA studies. The DNA studies that have been done on the Bronze Age people uh, suggest that they, you know, are, are European-based culture. But the earlier ancient Britons, uh, there's very, very little known about them because there's been uh, no DNA studies. It's like it's been just glossed over and ignored because they don't look like us and and they're short in statue. But the thing is about the Neolithic uh, long-skulled people of uh, ancient Great Britain is they moved the heaviest stones. When you look to an ancient site like Avebury Henge, which I briefly mentioned earlier, which is 70 miles to the north of Stonehenge, Avebury contains the largest stone circle in the world. It has a hundred, it did have a hundred standing stones creating the largest stone circle in the world, inside of which were two smaller stone circles containing roughly about 30 standing stones with avenues of standing stones that contain 200 standing stones uh, on probably four avenues. So this was an immense, immense uh, ancient site. But the first phase of Avebury Henge, like I said, Stonehenge started off with blue stone circle of 56 standing stones. That was dismantled and then other stones brought in to make the Stonehenge we're familiar with. Like at Avebury, you had phase one and the heaviest stone in Great Britain, over a 100 or so tons, was erected by the long-skulled people. Then later, these monuments were added to by the more round-skulled people from Europe that have skulls like you and I who created stone circles mm -hmm. around the original features. So when we look at a stone circle in the UK, we have to think phase one was the long skull people and they were added to over a long period of time. So the long skull people were moving the heaviest stones. It's quite remarkable. Right. So yeah. how were they yeah, moving the even these stones that were yeah, how were they moving these stones in the, the later generations and does anybody know why they were dismantling them and rearranging them? Any stories survive to explain you know, the constant moving of stones around and all these things? 
Well, it's Stonehenge with the redesigning from phase one to phase two to phase three to phase four. Uh, there's just ideas archaeological ideas as why this was this was happening because they certainly dismantled the blue stones in the, the large stone circle which was a lunar number 56 is a, a lunar number it registers three three cycles of the high moon that's the moon's most northerly moonrise which only happens every 18.61 years so the the ancient neolithic long skull people were very lunar based goddess type of culture and uh the the idea of why they how rather they moved the stone is still an enigma uh, uh, people really don't know. They have ideas about that, but nobody really knows whether it was, you know, sound frequencies, whether it was, you know, literally moving the stones across the landscape, which seems highly unlikely, because the source of the stones from Stonehenge comes from the Marlborough Downs, uh, quite close to where I live. Mm-hmm. And you have to go through immense hill ranges, some of which are, you know, 800 feet above sea level. And dragging a stone up there would be nigh impossible, let alone controlling it coming down the hill slope. So, so we literally right. don't. So they have, so they have these, um, um, re- representations of the UFOs delivering these so- stones, but, it seems to be something alien to, to make it happen in the first place. Some way it was levitated or something. Or wouldn't it, it being, being a, if it was dragged, wouldn't it still leave marks? You know, that, that large of a stone, wouldn't that leave marks in, on the land? You know, no, the, ne- some... the Neolithic landscape would be, uh, the old surface level of the Neolithic is way, way underground by probably about two meters. And you've got new mm-hmm. surface level on, on, on top of that. So you, you wouldn't see the, the drag marks. Uh, but, uh, whether that was, you know, UFOs or the ancient, uh, Britons, uh, we, we, we literally don't know. But what, what I suspect, mm-hmm is the sound frequencies of the earth current contributed to making a stone much lighter. Because in my own research looking at uh, megaliths, uh, you have seven points on a megalith, two of which are below ground, that seem to emit an electromagnetic signal in hertz frequency. And I've doused these, and I got an expert called Rodney Hale to measure these particular points on a standing stone. And I think the ancients could manipulate these sound frequencies and the earth energies to make the stone much lighter. That's what I, I suspect. If I had the funding, I could probably prove or disprove that. But it seems that the ancients knew so much about the metaphysical properties of a stone as much as the physical properties of stone. And when I uh, listen to people's experiences about leaning against these energy points on a stone, some people say they make them feel much lighter and other people say they make them themselves feel much heavier so it could have been a sense of manipulating these particular frequencies can't be ruled out wow uh, you know one, one uh, uh, set of uh, hypotheses that seems to account for some of the data uh, is a, a changing alignment with constellations uh, which are correlated uh, of course with uh, seasonal changes and uh, preparations that uh, Neolithic people would need to make for their uh, planting and and so forth, uh, due to precession of the equinoxes, the, the, the sort of shifting position, uh, as sliding off of certain corners and stuff. So that's a set of hypotheses that definitely appeals to me. And the other question I have about these uh, long-headed people, since uh, my teacher says that the same you know, Anki went to, went to Ireland too. Do you have a similar pattern of hinges uh, and and uh, overlay lines that intersect? Is the same and the long-headed people in Ireland also? Uh, yes, so the long skull people were across northwest 
Europe. So they were a kind oh. of long lost uh, race. And when we come to Ireland, for example, I've done a lot of research in, in Ireland and, and have lived there myself for a short period. We have the oldest monuments in the British Isles that predate Stonehenge by about 1,500 years. So on oh, the wow. west coast of Ireland, in a place called Sligo, you have the, the most ancient monuments. And it's thought that if indeed there was a continent called Atlantis in the Atlantic Ocean and there were survivors that didn't have oars in boats or you you were literally just a survivor like you would be today yeah then you would be let's mm-hmm. say on a raft and the natural currents of the atlantic ocean would take you to sligo in in ireland so so we see wow. a, a, a big monumental building program in ireland that could have been atlantean for for instance and they're, they're quite spectacular monuments, some of which are, are called uh, Caramore and Caracil in, in Ireland. And they're very sophisticated. And you were mentioning constellations uh, earlier and the procession of the equinox. When we look to Caracil in Ireland, and you've got to imagine you're on a mountain now, <laughs> you're high up on, on a mountain range, and the ancients uh, moved large amounts of white quartz stone, beautifully uh, spectacular. And they made these, what they call in Ireland, khans. They're like a stone temples with a huge uh, semicircle of uh, white quartz on top, inside of which you have these chambers or rooms, uh, if you like, white quartz boxes that that were spectacular to look at. They would have literally looked like semi-circles on top of mountains of white quartz reflecting the moonlight and the sunlight. And if you went inside these white quartz boxes, then you would have literally been inside a, a quartz chamber. But more than that, they aligned to, and this was the work of uh, E.A. James Swagger, they would have aligned to the constellation of Cassiopeia. And at midwinter, wow. if you were looking out of that chamber, you would have seen a star of Cassiopeia perfectly aligned in your visual perspective, uh, you know, view of, of that calm. So yes, they integrated constellations, solar alignments and lunar alignments alike. So it, it was star energy, solar energy and lunar energy. These were sophisticated astronomers uh, of the Neolithic period that knew the, how to align to very distant star constellations is a wonder. Yeah, wow. indeed. So, wow, thank you. That, that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, are, so, were the so the, these little people you're saying were all over north, northern uh, and uh, western Europe. I, I research yeah the the long skull people across uh, northwest Europe. That that is correct. And uh, did they extend uh, even further in, uh, into uh, Asia? How far did they did uh, uh, these long skulled people uh, spread? How far? How widespread? I suspect I haven't looked into uh, Asian museums or anything because I've I've focused on uh, Europe because. You know, you, ha- you have to go through antiquarian reports and you have to track down uh, skulls. It- it's quite a long process, uh, actually. Mm-hmm. But I do suspect that the in the Neolithic, the long-skulled people were prolific across uh, the the globe. That that's uh, what I suspect very very strongly. But in, in focusing in North uh, West Europe, they were quite short in stature. But it seems that, you know, maybe further out, they could have been taller, for for example, with some of the long bones that have been uh, recorded in some burials. So we need to reevaluate our understanding of ancient history and, uh, and acknowledge that these people existed because mainstream archaeologists dismiss 
the the what I call the like the holy history, the real history of places like Stonehenge and elsewhere in Europe, and where we are led to believe that our ancient ancestor ancestors looked like us and behaved like savages. I mean, it's ridiculous. I agree Great. totally. Yes, uh, but you know, one of the things that interests me also is. Uh, if we had enough skeletons, are there hybridization? Uh, are they uh, single species uh, with us? And this is just an example of raciation. That is, can they uh, breed uh, viable offsprings? And if so, where's the evidence? And uh, I, I suspect that their genes are not disappeared, but are among us. That 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 could uh, indeed be uh, be the case because when it came to the the brief DNA studies that have been done on the Bronze Age people and that they're from four and a half thousand years ago, if we are to believe the timelines of archaeologists, I actually think the timeline is much much further back. But just for mm -hmm. argument's sake, we're we're use their terms. The Bronze Age in England is four and a half thousand years ago. With the round skulled people, they seem to have come a spread across Europe. And in the Stonehenge environs, what I discovered, shockingly so, was that the the round skulled beaker culture, as it's known, uh, uh, probably murdered quite a lot of the Neolithic people because around Stonehenge yes. inside the Long Barrows I noticed that most people had uh, damage to their skulls so there must have been some big conflict round about uh, four and a half thousand years ago but that doesn't account for all of the long skulled people because not everybody got buried at their deposits in a Long Barrow I think they could have brought disease as well, which could have uh, contributed to the long-skulled people's demise. Yeah, wow. that that's really a, a powerful a, a revision of, of sort of the older history that it was uh, these shifting nomads, the, the Kurdian uh, type people uh, that uh, basically uh, overran uh everybody else uh but but you're giving an alternate uh way of looking at this that's fascinating <laughs> uh, but, 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 wow. but, but, well for sure i mean uh, the evidence is clear from the uh antiquarian accounts and from the deposits found in museums that the people around stonehenge the long skull people met their fate through being murdered when it came to the long, the large long barrow I, I briefly described earlier on the Salisbury Plain, and let's let's remind ourselves that the Salisbury Plain is a military area close to Stonehenge. Stonehenge is surrounded by military camp after military camp. The military own the land. And it's mm. very difficult to get onto the Salisbury Plain, of which the Mil Ministry of Defence own in the, the UK anyway, okay? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a military landscape. And that's what most people don't realise. If you go one and a half miles to the north of Stonehenge, you come to one of the largest uh, military-controlled uh, camps at Lark Hill, Okay. Then, then if you go seven miles uh, across the Salisbury Plain from Stonehenge on a lay, you come to our largest nuclear and biological centre. It's all surrounded oh by God. Stonehenge. Wow. Is there uh, some theory that you have as to why they are taking these spaces? Is it something to do with the energy from the ley lines? Well, it's it's the Weather. the earth currents, vortexes, ley lines. You know, you have power of place, and Stonehenge is a power place, and right. uh, so it's no coincidence with a, a large vortex on the inside of it, numerous lays going through earth currents, earth voltages, all adds to the power of Stonehenge, and that's what the the military know. So on that military land, you have all of the long barrows that I'm describing that had these deposits in them that showed that the people had been been murdered uh, in effect. Ooh. But I'm trying to stress it's very difficult to research this. And I was the first UK researcher ever to discover the long skull people. 
because it's it, you can't visit these places quite freely and you have to look into antiquarian reports and museums to find out what was in these monuments so it, it is wow. it's a difficult process and that's why our history has been repressed because it's a land owned by the military and the deposits were put into museums into cardboard boxes literally and squirreled away in archives is a fact yeah we've found that a lot so they don't want us to know what's really going on there um exactly. when you did see the skull uh, some of the the skulls we're finding and they actually found some giants over here <coughs> we live in maui hawaii and uh, i guess about 10 years ago they found some giant uh, long skulls and they quickly removed them and uh, they uh, cemented in the entire uh, cave or whatever it was in. So we see the evidence of them hiding it all over the world. Um, I was looking on, on your description here. So you, what, what's the association with the queens and kings to these well, uh, think- Stonehenge yeah, I think in, in the Neolithic period of the long skulled, long lost history, the secret history of, uh, Stonehenge, then they were probably either the priesthood or kings or, or queens of, of the, of the, of the landscape. Uh, I, I suspect that quite strongly because not everybody went into a long barrow when they were deceased. You have a lot of what we call flat graves, which is what you and I will go into. We're going to, you know, a flat grave. So you have a lot of flat graves in the Neolithic, but you also have these very special monumental places that were the long barrows where people were interned, uh, into so they must have had some kind of very strong presence uh, in, in the landscape and the the woman that i found in the largest long barrow in northwest europe was probably a high ranking priestess or a high ranking high queen because it was unprecedented for one person to go into these long barrows. Normally 40 people went into them, but the largest long barrow on the Salisbury Plain on military land had one person in it and one person alone as a primary burial. So she was very, very, very special. And she too had oh. been murdered. Wow. This is a very, very, very important find because it, the, the whole world is on the balance between dominator consciousness and partnership consciousness. And to find ancient ancestors who, uh, where women have high status like that indicate as like a, a, a gleam of hope. <laughs> Exactly, and that that's a, a beautiful and wonderful uh, comment because in the Neolithic period, these long-skulled people lived in harmony in the landscape. Uh, they really did. It was an us culture because they shared their resources. It wasn't until the round-skulled aggressors which came in and dominated the landscape, that in the UK, Ireland and Scotland and France, ancient Gaul, they started to divide up the land and saying, this is mine, this is my land, instead of this is our land. So the whole of the uh, prehistoric history changed around uh, 2500 BC to an ego-dominated, like solar uh, masculine dominated culture that said about land ownership and large parts of the landscape were divided up around Stonehenge and Avebury so the culture did change and I think we can learn from this ancient distant culture and become a more an us <laughs> orientated uh, culture yeah. again. I think that's our only well, hope to survive <laughs> absolutely <laughs> great so, um, Sasha, do you, do you have any insight um, based on your Anunnaki research? We we so uh, uh, yeah, um, basically so. yes, I, I do indeed. It's like uh, once the uh, uh, at twenty twenty five uh, twenty twenty four BCE uh, when Sodom and Gomorrah were uh, nuked as well as the Sinai spaceport, according to uh, the records, at least that we have from the. Uh, 
the Sumerians, the Enuma Elisha, and the like, uh, and Marduk's uh, uh, Aryans basically spread uh, this warlike uh, culture uh, over the areas that had been partnership, uh, where towns had been right on the bo- uh, you know, on, on the uh, border of waters, no fortification, no caches of arms. Uh, uh, no slaves, women were depicted in the highest of offices, and it was share, widespread trade. Basically, it came to a flower in Mycenaean uh, civilization, uh, which was one of the last standing goddess cultures. And then, basically, uh, warlike people, uh, first of you know, in uh, Europe, and coming up in 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 the Palestinian area, the followers of. Uh, uh, the, the Jews that became very uh, in their fights, then Islam, and you get the uh, recession of the real partnership, which is our natural uh, ability. We have uh, certain kinds of uh, pow- people that have rebelled against these what I call dominator consciousness, hierarchy, greed, who has the most obsession. And you get the people like Jesus and the Buddha way be- 500 years before that that said, this is nonsense, you're getting ripped off. And so we got to return to partnership. That's that's my two cents. Right. Well, well, that's wow. that's right. And in in the second part of uh, the show, I'll describe you know how the Stonehenge Phase One was a goddess based uh, culture, uh, as indeed it was uh, in other places of the British Isles and Europe compared to a solar based, um, more masculine traits. Uh, of, a, of a community so the evidence is very similar uh, in the UK so that's a very valid point that you've raised uh, thank you cool great and we're going we're gonna to be coming up on our break in just a minute so um, Matt are we going to be on uh, schedule here with our break coming up at 56 yeah, top yeah. Of the hour yeah okay cool so we have about 30 seconds so we'll discuss all that and I wonder if you could bring it up uh, all the way to modern times because I'm I get confused <laughs> about the you know what happened in the early years. I'm not really aware of that period of history. I'm really curious about it because we do somehow um, transition into you know Camelot and kings and the, that whole modern era. Uh, like you said, um, we have all these kings and queens and priests and uh, that whole uh, history there. So how does the, the ancients tie into this modern era? So maybe we can cover that after the break. And what else would you like to cover after the break, Maria? Well, you well, know, yeah, it's, I, it's I, like I, yeah, I would I, really I like to hear cover, about I could cover like that, that in, in kind world. of medieval period uh, for sure and uh, discuss how the knowledge was transferred to the Druids and I myself am a Druid and uh, okay. discuss that. Excellent. Sounds like we have a course of action here. Sorry, you guys are talking over each other, and um, so we're waiting for the music. So, Sasha, what do you want to know? Yeah, well, I'm interested. Yeah, I'm interested in this succession of, of around heads, the people that came over mm-hmm. and on coracles, and the people that the, that you know the the the, the, the uh, Irish have a, had a term for the little people that ran around there, and that they were displaced by the people from. Uh, they came over from Spain. That that's right. You have the 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 Fay, uh, and you have the two Arthur de Danad that Those were the, the original people of ancient Ireland that uh, had a had a semester. war, and they went back into the mountain to the earth. We can discuss that as well. What do you will remain a dictatorship? We'll be back in five. Oh, be quiet. Why are you guys so anti-dictators? Imagine if America was a dictatorship. You could let 1% of the people have all the nation's wealth. You could help your rich friends get richer by cutting their taxes and bailing them out when they gamble and lose. You could ignore the needs of the poor for health care and education. Your media would appear free, but would secretly be controlled by one person and his family. You could wiretap phones. You could torture foreign prisoners. You could have rigged elections. You could lie about why you go to war. You could fill your prisons with one particular racial group, and no one would complain. 
You could use the media to scare the people into supporting policies that are against their interests. Tune in Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time for Liberation Nation with Deacon John, where America comes to hear the truth. I know this is hard for you Americans to imagine, but please try Ohio Exo Politics will be on from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Studio A. Mark Steyer will have guests on that will discuss many important topics, including the state of the world today. However, much of the show will be dedicated to the writings of Edward Albert Meyer. Let me read a short passage from one of his writings. Love is the highest principle of creation, and through it, everything exists in absolute logic. All of nature in its indescribable splendor is nothing but the love of creation, which is expressed visibly. The love of creation is everywhere, because without it, nothing at all would be able to exist. Please join Mark on Ohio Exopolitics from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Studio A. It is no secret that the so-called mainstream media is best described as controlled propaganda. Countless news stories are either totally ignored or spun with half-truths, and because of this, essential facts and vital information are often compromised. Join Dr. Ott every Friday night on Studio B at 10 p.m. Eastern and learn why the story behind the story was nominated for a Peabody Award in its second year of producing Unparalleled Broadcasting Excellence in 1997. That is, if you really care about learning the truth. Transcending time and space, let us take you to the place inside your mind where thoughts divide and mysteries unwind. Join us every Monday evening right here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And you will catch the Fenton Perspective with our great host, Lorian Fenton. Come listen in as she shares her amazing stories from the past to present, along with all of her guest secrets to the future. That's the Fenton Perspective every Monday evening right here from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time, only on Revolution Radio. Oh, and uh, you don't need to expect us. We're already here. It happens more often than we can imagine. In my case, I was sitting at home, and out of nowhere, I just started feeling uncomfortable. Then it got worse, and I started perspiring. I tried to ignore it, but I waited too long. The chest pain came as we were driving to the hospital emergency. I felt my life clock begin to tick. I barely survived. There was lots of damage done to my heart. What do I do now? I was lucky. I took a leap of faith and tried a seven-herb formula with hawthorn, garlic, cayenne, and more called Extendivite. Herbs have been used for thousands of years to keep us healthy. If you're not using Extendivite as a preventative supplement, maybe it's time to start. To order, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Janet, are you there? 
Oh, it seems Oops, like okay. we've lost. Welcome yeah. back. There, there she Hello, is. Hello, <laughs> Hawk. Can you hear me? Sorry, I was on mute. I forgot to unmute. Sorry. So unprofessional me. Sorry. Anyway, welcome back to Stargate Through Cosmos on Revolution Radio. And I'm your host, um, Janet Kira Lesson with Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson and our producer, Thomas Becker. And Maria Wheatley is our guest this week, and we're talking about all these different uh, ruins and things in the UK and on the other islands. So uh, before we get back to our show, let's remind everybody to please go over to the donation button on revolution.radio and make a donation. Uh, we've had an expensive month this month because we had to replace our server and additional costs, so we would really appreciate you going over and make a donation. Mad Painter, Thomas, how are we doing in our fundraising? Any better than the now other day? Still- yeah, we still only have seven thirty three and that's been that way for three days now, so Oh my please, god. Please, please, a couple please, of dollars please. here and there would help. Yes, please. Okay, Sasha, are you back? I, I sure Sweetheart, am. And we're really there. lucky to have we're really lucky to have an A lister like uh, Maria to uh, in, inform us about uh, something about basically uh, the way people lived before that can, if we regress to some of the usness that these people had, can save our species. So that's something to really know. And I'd like to pass on uh, my friend Freddie Silva uh, has said, you know, go to a sacred spot. Go, go to one of these wonderful places. Put yourself in the vibration of those places. Make a coherent field with those who have used it before and just let, let that come to you. And you're going to get some wisdom, I bet you. Well, in, in Druidry, yeah, we, we, well, in Druidry we say a little bit more than that, actually. What, what we say about interacting with, uh, with an ancient site, you go to the spirit of place, which is what you've just described. You absorb the spirit of place. You honor the ancestors and the old gods and you merge yourself, uh, with, with the site because in Druidry we see everything as being living. And you are part of this living uh, web of of consciousness, and and the the ancients uh, are my tradition of of druidry was born from these ancient people and these ancient places. So uh, we we really do see as you merge with the land, you become the land, and the land becomes you, and you breathe as one. And even the ancient high kings of Ireland. Before they were allowed to marry, like the high queens of Ireland, you married the land. You became one and you wow. became responsible for, for the fertility of, of the land uh, as well. So it really is about thinking about the ancient people. And this is what we've forgotten. And this is where my research comes in. We've forgotten who built the first sites, the Long Skull people. And when I visited the what I call the High Queen or the High Priestess of Stonehenge, uh, I... Um, Ask great spirits and my old gods like uh, Karidwen to give me some time alone with this skull. And as, as the magical universe blessed me, the curator went away <laughs> and left me for a little while with the skull. And I put my hands over her throat chakra and her brow chakra. And I, I went along her long skull with my hands. And I believe that the long skull people had two crown chakras. There, there was definitely two energy points on her, her like her higher skull, uh, if you will. So I think that their skulls interacted with the energies and the landscape in ways that we really don't understand. And how we interact with the landscape now is on a on a kind of different uh, level, but a, a wonderful level nonetheless. And when I take people to uh, ancient sites, I always offer mistletoe, which you, you would offer tobacco like in, in the uh, ancient sites. And I only allow people to a- enter an ancient site through the correct entrances that our ancient ancestors went through as well. And we walk what's called clockwise around a stone circle, never anti-clockwise, which is called Widdishins. 
Uh, and that's not how you would walk around a stone circle. And if you walk around clockwise, uh, you flow around what's called an ancient earth energy pattern called a geospiral. Now, a geospiral, uh, I, as a second generation dowser, my family inherited all the unpublished surveys of Stonehenge and numerous sites from another master dowser called Guy Underwood, who published a book, but it was the wrong book that went to print, so it's full of uh, mistakes. But I've inherited the knowledge of the geodetic system of Earth energy, and all ancient sites are sited upon a geospiral energy pattern. Imagine a spiral uh, in the landscape. But what is this? What generates that spiral pattern? And this is where uh, my knowledge of being an esoteric water diviner comes in. That spiral pattern is generated generated by water born within the earth, independent of rainfall. Uh, water created by Gaia. A geologist would say you are crazy <laughs> because water falls from the sky and fills up the aquifers. Yes, it does. That's yang water that produces a threefold energy line in the landscape that registers geopathic stress. That's not good to live above. That will give you cancer, according to all the German uh, geomants. So this positive energy of a spiral pattern, the geospiral, is what the ancestors looked for. And they placed their stone circles, their long barrows, their curses monuments, their caused wade enclosures above this energy pattern of what I call yin water. When I've registered these frequencies, they're between about 7 and uh, 10 hertz. So these long ah. skull people, they they knew about this very, very deep yin water uh, as a tradition I've been brought up with. And the Chinese geomancers that taught myself and, and my uh, family how to douse always said that Peking, or modern-day Beijing, if you want to be politically correct, was sited above a vast amount of underground water. That's what they taught me. And with recent, you know, uh, sophisticated uh, material looking for oils and minerals uh, beneath uh, uh, modern-day Beijing, they found an underground aquifer, not like a normal aquifer, but the size of the North Sea, a sea beneath wow. Peking. Uh, and this this water generates positive energy, and it's where we get our word currency from. It's the currents to do with the deep underground water that represents money in ancient China, for example. So when we enter an ancient site, we are entering the geospiral energy pattern that brings our consciousness into our alpha brain waves, that brings us into harmony with Gaia's human resonance as well. It's that emergence, that becoming one with an ancient site. Wow. Uh, you know, that also uh, fits well with uh, Freddie Silva's noticing that uh, in places like Karnak, you have a, a basically a, 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 an energy grid in that the electromagnetics uh, um, above are uh, e extremely uh, interesting. And uh, we have... Uh, magnetite within our bloodstream and so that vibrates too and if you get a whole group of people it's even more powerful I do hope you're teaching seminars I, God, I wish I could come and study with you uh, this is fascinating I love it, thank you so much yeah, yeah I, I do teach on my teaching website at esotericcollege.com uh, and my website theaveryexperience.co.uk but but more than that, I'm just touching on it. It's more than electromagnetic. We've banded that word around for decades in Dowson. But the early French discoverers of Karnak, and let's face it, when you go to France, listen to the French people rather than a British or whatever. Listen to the people and their studies. Their studies have shown that it's more than electromagnetic. Those stone rows of Karnak are aligned upon very different changes in the gravitational fields. 
So it's, it's not just electromagnetic that our ancient ancestors were looking for. Mm. They knew about gravitational differences. And you place mm. a, a granite type of stone, and Karnak stones are a hard granite type of stone, like the sarcophagus in the uh, king's chamber is granite. The king's chamber is full of granite, okay? Now, that granite type of material, when you place it into uh, a gravitational field, produces its own radiation levels. Oh. Radiation. So, so you're, you're on a threefold thing. You're electromagnetic, you're gravitational, and you're radiation. And the tests that I've done around this area, far beyond the electromagnetic studies, and I've got the frequencies of Earth energies as well, but today it's very difficult to get the frequencies of Earth energies because we've got so much electromagnetic smog that a man's creating, and that's without the advent of 5G. OK, because what I've recorded at right. some stone circles is those stones on those seven energy bands I described earlier are starting to admit man-made signals. Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's what they're designed to do. They're designed to absorb birth energy, pull it out of the ground, transmit it across the air in an aerial form of energy that I describe as a Neolithic Wi-Fi. <laughs> no wires there. But we have to take responsibility for that e-smog. So all of the tests done within 10 years on ancient site has been influenced by man-made signals, that's for sure. And that's what my, my team have suggested. But what I found also at ancient sites is radiation levels. Now, when you put a granite stone into an earth energy pattern, that could be a ley line, a grid line, an earth current, a geospiral. We're going to call all of that collectively earth energy. Then you put your, your, your granite stone in like at Karnak. Now, whenever this, this is a geological fact, whenever the sun and uh, moon move over the landscape like in a sunrise or a moonrise or a sunset or a moonset it creates this a magical effect in the land called a sheer force imagine a tidal wave going in and out yeah we can all visualize that a tidal wave well that happens in the ground and when you have a granite stone like in Karnak it creates a piezoelectrical effect going up the stone so we can generate electricity so it's, it's, it's more than just one thing, which is I'm trying to, to get across. It's more than just electromagnetic. Yeah. We, we need to go beyond that vocabulary mm -hmm. and understand mm -hmm. that the ancients, my goodness, they knew far, far more about stone than we ever do today. <laughs> yeah, wow. Wow. Have you ever been able to um, compare notes with uh, Michael Kellinger from South Africa about what I've he's discovered about the stones? I was Michael Tellinger's guide for Stonehenge and Avery uh, in 2010. So I described to Michael crosstalk at stone circles uh, and uh, different sounds because I was on a show uh, last year with a very famous American actress called Megan Fox. Yep, she's she's an American actress. Yes, yes, uh huh. She was doing mm -hmm. a show over here yes. called, I think it was Legends of the Last or Lost Legends. I, I Forgive me, I can't remember the exact name of the show. But I, I said uh, to Megan that the ancients were into sound. And I told Michael Tellinger this because my studies from the uh, stones say that the signal of one particular energy band, what I call a chakra point of the stone, is at 18 hertz. You hear at 20 hurts so i think our ancient ancestors could hear the stones it wasn't just a visual perspective yeah they could hear the sounds emitted by the stones now it's always been said in wales that the blue stones they're the first stones of stonehenge that were carted uh, 120 or so miles to stonehenge had uh, sound healing properties because some of the early medieval church bells were made from bluestone, not from metal, but from bluestones because of the acoustic properties. Now, uh, I suggested uh, that to, to Megan and we were talking about sound. So they had the funds to go to Bristol University and test the sound frequency of bluestones being 
banged together or placed like together, rigged her up to test her brain frequencies and the sound of the blue stones of Stonehenge puts you into a healing modality. Yeah. Which, which, uh, I, I suspect very strongly that that's what was being used at Stonehenge. It was a healing temple as much as anything else. So I'm quite familiar with, you know, some of Michael Tellinger's work. And like I say, I was, uh, his, his guide and Brian Forrester's and Robert Ravel's guide for, for Stonehenge. I've taken some very well known people around these sites and give them a different perspective because for me yes I'm a druid yes I'm very uh, intuitive but I blend my knowledge of being a second generation earth energy expert with science because there's a lot of people out there that would go dowsing really Maria <laughs> yeah, really and so once we start to blend science with uh, the long lost wisdom of our ancestors, we start to get coherent ans- answers. And in my work in Dowson, what I, I'm really proud of is I've taught architects from Italy and elsewhere how to detect particular earth energies and earth frequencies to incorporate into modern builds because some of the earth frequencies are healing, some are energetic. Yeah, some can change your your consciousness. And what is the point in me studying all of this if I can't apply it to a modern generation? And it is my passion, my love to exchange this energy and say, let's live like our ancient ancestors in the heartbeat and harmony of Gaia. I love it. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about the Druids? Who are the Druids? What does it mean? need to be a modern day druid who were they in ancient times the the ancient druids inherited their wisdom of earth energies and um, a particular lunar calendar and solar calendar from the stone circle builders of the bronze age so our tradition is steeped in the megalithic culture because in in the ancient stone circle builders they they incorporated what we call the wheel of the year, the solar year. And the solar year has eight very significant points in it. It has the <clears throat> equinoxes of the spring and autumn, the summer solstice and the winter solstice. That makes four fest- four sun festivals, as we call it. Then you have what's called the cross-quarter days, of which we've had one recently. May the 1st is Beltane. Uh, February the 1st is Imbolc. And August the 1st is Lammas, and the start of the Celtic year, the start of the Druid year is Samhain. And that was Christianized to Halloween, October the 31st. But November the 1st, which was Christianized to All Saints Days, was the start of the Celtic year. And that's a time when you do divination to find out the future, because the veil between this world and the next at uh, Samhain, Halloween, is when the ancestors ancestors can come out and interact with us or the portals become very close to us that we can interact with and that's why halloween is celebrated as people walking around as skeletons is an ancient celtic druid festival called Samhain. so this so these ancient eightfold uh, part of the year is very in uh, a part of druidry but the ancients uh, also aligned their ancient sites to that so on the hill of tara in ireland you have a Neolithic monument called the Mound of Hostages that's al- uh, aligned to the sunrise of Samhain and Imbolc. So our tradition is steeped in this ancient megalithic uh, culture. So we would celebrate the, the eightfold year at ancient sto- sites such as Avebury. If you went to Avebury last weekend, we were celebrating Beltane. Well, I was actually in, in Scotland with the BBC filming, but if I had been free, I would have been celebrating Beltane. 
uh, at, at, at Avery. So it's really all about understanding the natural world around us and, and celebrating the life force of Gaia and becoming one with, uh, with the land, one with the trees, one with the, with the, with the stones and, and emerging our, our consciousness, uh, with that. So to be a, a modern day, uh, druid, it, it's about, uh, loving the, the nature, learning about the natural cycles of life and understanding how the sun's position in the heavens can influence our consciousness wow that's beautiful i would just say another thing you can do wherever you are or we we hippies in maui do is we bury our feet uh, uh, uh up to the ankles in the uh, sand and let the uh, surf roll back and forth or stand barefooted on the roots of a great tree and send your roots down the tree's roots and the whole thing is to let yourself feel uh Gaia consciousness to feel what it's like to uh, love all the creatures and features of this planet well, that that's beautiful, uh, and that's very much, uh, you know, like in the in the Druid tradition, you you ground yourself, you you know, you kick off your your shoes, as it were, and uh, and you you become uh, one with nature because there's a real disconnect. I mean, we, I mean, even when I take people around ancient sites these days, I ask them not to, uh, you know, interact through their mobile phone. Because so many people, even when I was in Egypt uh, a few weeks ago, two weeks ago, so many people uh, interact with an ancient site through their mobile phone. And yet that mobile <laughs> phone is interfering with the, the signals of the, of the, of the stones. It's, we, we have a disconnect with nature now. And that's why what you have just said is shared beauty, saying let's get back to that natural thing. And by the way, I want to go to where you live and do that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go oh, to where you this. live. <laughs> I, I did my ancestry, and I'm I'm like eighty nine or ninety some percent UK, so I've got to get back to my roots. And um, what I used to do when I went to the museums is I would go over and touch these ancient uh, building uh, stone fronts. You weren't supposed to touch them, so I would just put my fingertip, like barely touching, and then I started getting all these images about you know where it was building was from and the streets and people walking. Have, have you or anybody else that you know gone over and touched the stones and gotten any stories about the people, you know, visions or stories? Maybe I'm just a witch. I don't know why it won't work for me, but and, uh, no, 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 so. yeah, yeah. Stories? Well, first thing about an ancient site, uh, let's, let's go back to, to basics. That, that underground deep water I was talking about, yin water, as I phrased it, because it's born within the womb of Gaia. What does water have? It has memory. Okay. So where, wherever you've got underground water, be that in your home or be that at an ancient site, you can access the Akashic records of that site. Yeah. Bye. By interacting yes. with with that underground uh, water. Now, when you place yes. stones in that geo spiral, uh, it's, it's being energized by that deeper underground water's frequency uh, field. You can interact with with the stone, with uh, with the uh, underground water. So you can interact with energies on uh, various different levels at ancient sites. What are we made of? Water, aren't we? We're, mm-hmm. we're predominantly yep. water. Yes. So so part of my uh, interaction with ancient sites when I take people around uh, sites is we interact with the underground water to cleanse and purify our own body water. Because when you when you get this sacred yin water, the ancients used to put bowls above it, like in Ireland, in Newgrange, you always find massive bowls. You do in Egypt, actually, uh, Abu Ghraib. And these massive bowls uh, uh, may have contained water that charges up through the underground water. Do you see what I mean? Anything you place in that energy field that's water can be cleansed. So I think by cleansing our body water from time to time above our ancient site rejuvenates us and, and makes us feel 
clean uh, and cleanse on the inside out. So there's so many different ways that you can interact with an ancient site. It's not like one thing for all. <laughs> do you see what I mean? You, uh, you can do things on, on different yes. levels. And Let, what let we me run something Sorry. Uh, by you, Maria. Uh, one of my friends, uh, uh, he's called the Peacemaker, uh, he has taken to going to the sacred spots in uh, uh, Florida and playing music at, uh, at 324 uh, hertz instead of 377 hertz. And the energy ramps up amazingly. And so I would imagine that chanting uh, uh, would be a, uh, would really be a facilitative thing to do in a sacred site, too. But that's amazing because you mentioned that uh, 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 your, your friend Peacekeeper, did you call him? Uh, that's Peacemaker. 24. Peacemaker, uh, apologies, Peacemaker, okay. as 24 hertz. Well, back in, oh gosh, it must have been uh, 15 years ago now. Thank goodness we did the test then because it'd be a nonsense now with uh, all of the interfering man-made signals. We placed large copper probes on an earth energy current that entwines a ley line at Avebury and we got 24, 25 hertz from that earth energy. So your friend is pretty uh, amazing he's bringing himself into harmony with any earth current in the vicinity and that is absolutely beautiful wow wow it's great it's, is that it's michael lee hill you're talking yeah, about like, yeah, michael lee hill is his yeah, uh, or An uh, anki is his is some of his uh other names but the point is is that people all over are converging from whatever uh, part of the elephant of reality that they grab on, on uh, sort of the bigger picture. There's a, there's an elephant here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I'm in, in full uh, agreement with that. And when we look at the size of ancient sites in the UK, like Avebury Henge, which is very different to Stonehenge, Avebury Henge is massive. It's over 28 acres and you could fit thousands of people into Stonehenge where you could only fit about sort of 60 people into Stonehenge comfortably. But if we look to the larger henges like Avebury Henge and Stanton Drew, you, you fit, like I said, thousands of people in. And I think it was the us the, the 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 consciousness and you know if you have that amount of people you can you can raise a vast amount of consciousness so when we look at the ancient sites over here they are vast but when we look at the ancient sites in america like newark in ohio for example uh -huh. i'll be doing some tours and dowsing workshops in america uh, next year, uh, this year rather, I'll be going over to New England to America's Stonehenge on October the 6th. So any listeners that are interested in any learning about Earth energy, come along and uh, learn uh, with me. Uh, you have the largest mounds in the world and the largest henge in the world uh, at Newark in Ohio, for, for example. That far is far, far greater than Avebury Henge over here, which is our largest stone circle. And you have the largest mound. We have Silbury Hill here. That's a very large man-made mound. Uh, but in America, you have uh, Monk's Mount in Cahokia. That's the, the largest mound in the world. You, you have yes. some amazing yes. ancient sites. There's giant right. skeletons. Uh, way, the, the Indians, that uh, North American Indians, were latecomers. Way uh, down deep. There's giant uh, uh, skeletons that the Smithsonian has, has uh, knew of and hid, <laughs> and uh, the, the whole area that you're talking about, uh, the uh, this area of the Seneca, uh, uh, who uh, basically were part of the Hosowani or uh, Iroquois Federation, which was a, a a goddess culture where there was a partnership, and and the, uh, it, there was this is where. Uh, something very, very magical was happening in North America. And I'm so glad you're going there. I know you're going to find great, very, very interesting stuff. 
Well, that's right. I mean, uh, in the Hawaii, uh, Ohio area, you have uh, researchers like Jason uh, Jarrell that has been looking into uh, the giants and the Adena culture there. And he's written a book, The Age of Giants, I think it is, which is very uh, uh, informative. So and when we look to how they, they're, some of your sites are laid out uh, in, in my research shows that you do, the, the, like over here, we were associating our sites with earth currents, not just lays. The American terminology for earth energy is the lays, lays, lays. You need to think that surrounding, entwining that lay, you have two earth currents and the earth currents are more important to the ancient prehistoric designers than the lay par se, because the lay will link to another site, yeah? So the the earth currents mm-hmm. determine, and the geospirals and other energies we don't have time to uh, go into, determine the megalithic architecture of a site. Do you see what I'm saying? So the, the those yes, ground yes. energies are very, very important, especially the earth uh, earth currents that are either male or female for example and this was known and documented in ancient china from 2200 bc because you had an emperor wow. there that was a dowser so he was you know very au fait with uh, with these types of uh, energies and at america's stonehenge you have uh, more than one earth current there actually, uh, more than two. You have three earth currents there. So, so I know for, for a fact that the, the ancients there were on a, making their monuments incorporate these, uh, wonderful, powerful earth currents. Yes, it, it was, it, uh, one, one area in the Seneca area, the people came, uh, especially around Lake Michigan for copper, huge coppers. That were then hammered out in certain design, and we have uh, found p- ancient Scandinavians and people from all over have traded through that whole area, way beyond the histories that we've been allowed to uh, learn. Uh, exactly. I mean, the ancient people were trading, you know, from uh, and and the more modern day archaeologists are, are, are realizing uh, this. I mean, even around the Stonehenge area, in some of the burial mounds, you have beads from Egypt, amber from Estonia, uh, and, and the and the and the Vikings uh, of the sort of like the, the the Dark Ages, the early medieval period. They were excellent seafarers. I mean, they were. They too were trading all over the the known world, uh, and and France uh, especially were were trading. So, so yes, I mean our ancient ancestors were were you know connecting across across the world because you get stone circles worldwide from India, you know, to to Scandinavia, mm-hmm. to to Ireland, and far 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 beyond. So the way I see it, there there was a more a settled period of time that was a goddess-based culture in the Neolithic, and what they were looking for in the Neolithic for celestial uh, alignments was the night of the high moon. Now the night of the high moon only happens every eighteen point six one years in the moon's metonic cycle. So the first phase at Stonehenge with the heel stone, the heel stone at Stonehenge, world famous now for the rising of the midsummer sun at the summer solstice, okay, to come above, but any archaeo astronomer of its worth would say to you, but it's more accurate to the midpoint of the moon's metonic cycle, where every nine years the full moon will rise perfectly above the heel stone. The sun is a degree out, but we're spoon fed all of the time. The solar energy of Stonehenge, the solar energy, but the lunar energy there is far, far more powerful. And imagine that you're at Stonehenge, phase one on the, light, on the night of the longest moon, every 18.61 years, you're at the center of Stonehenge 
of that blue stone circle. You're looking towards at midwinter to the heel stone. It's an eclipse predictor. The ancient long skull people were into predicting eclipses. Imagine now a blood red moon rising above the heel stone. And lunar uh, calculations are far, far more difficult than a solar calculation. So phase one of Stonehenge and the original position of the heel stone was about a lunar goddess culture and then in the bronze age they made the uh, avenue at stonehenge the entrance if you will much wider so from the center of stonehenge it was a near alignment to the to the sun because they were changing emphasis from the dark night the night of the high moon is the the longest night of moonlight uh, it is a beautiful time of the year, still celebrated in uh, in Wiccan witchcraft and and, and elsewhere uh, across uh, across Europe. So uh, so yes, Stonehenge was originally a goddess community. Were incorporating complex lunar alignments and at the time of an eclipse, it's very interesting to note that the Earth energies go quiet. Everything is ceased at the time. And then just after an eclipse, Earth energies reboot. <laughs> you know, a bit like rebooting your computer. It reboots oh up God. into a dynamic, new and refreshed Earth energy system. That's why our ancient ancestors used Stonehenge as an eclipse predictor. It's so, so accurate to to use. It's a computer to to some regards, an astronomical computer. Wow, and you know that that, that uh, movement of the of sun and the moon uh, it is, it, you know, in a way symbolic of uh, how uh, dominator consciousness has eclipsed uh, uh, partnership consciousness, but it's really just a a, a, a propaganda trick. <laughs> it's not true. Exactly. And, uh, you know, excellent. Uh, uh, jolly well said uh, in full agreement. And when we look at what was happening in the landscape with the early monuments, like I said earlier, it was an us culture. Then came the uh, more taller uh, round skulled people. And what I noticed in my research was that the long barrows of the elongated uh, skulled people were all elongated in shape. Then when it came to the burial deposits of the round skulled people, they only built round, round barrows to intern themselves in. So the shape of the skull reflected the, 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 the type of burial uh, mound uh, as well. So well, wow. when we when we think about the ancient landscape, we really do need to think about two completely different cultures. And then the round skull people came in, they attacked the spiritual capital of Britain, which was Stonehenge. They then uh, removed their first monument and kind of tinkered around with some stone settings. And at the other sites with the large stones that they moved, they built around them. They added to them by changing in them uh, in some way and we know this through uh, deposits in the uh, old surface level of our ancient sites so my research really does focus on the long lost people and their monumental design and this is what I'm going to be talking about at Contact in the Desert and I'm going to be doing a workshop uh, as well uh, on dowsing which people will be welcome to but what is an oh, earth wow. Yeah, what, what, what is an earth current? People talk about earth energies, lays. Well, what is it? And how does it interact with the sun? Why are certain ley lines orientated to the summer solstice? Beltane, May the 1st, or, or whatever. We need to think in 3D when we think about earth energies and ley lines. It's earth energy coming out of the ground that interacts with uh, the solar force of the sun, the consciousness of the sun. 
at the turn of the last century, well, about 19, let's say 1930, actually, to be more accurate, there were French diviners called Traumary and de Belazin, and they created a laboratory, and they realized that they're in the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt, that the, the mummified uh, people were buried with a pendulum device, which they called the Karnak pendulum or the Isis pendulum. And they thought, well, what are these devices? And they're all over the Valley of the Kings. When I take people to Egypt, I, I teach them how to use the Isis pendulum. Not just in Egypt, actually, you know, but elsewhere. Anyway, so the, you have these devices the the French dowsers uh, discovered, and they realised that the sun has a consciousness and a, a electromagnetic frequency spectrum that has yes, all of the seven colours we're familiar with, red through to violet and infrared and ultraviolet that some insects can detect, but other hidden frequency colours. One of which is called the negative green. Green. And they uh, and uh, Chomery in his laboratory in France in the 1930s filled an object so full of the negative green that he was found one week later. This went down in Dowson history. He was found one week later in his laboratory, completely mummified with no smell of smell of fermentation, death smell. So we know that the frequencies of the land are color orientated uh, that can interact with the solar force of energy that has this 12 colored spectrum far beyond what science would say a prism uh, gives and this is also what uh, what I teach about earth energies is how it interacts with the the solar force as well and the French diviners then went on to explore what these color frequencies can do and one of the uh, French diviners realized that you could suspend using particular pendulum devices the life force of cells. So one was, exp sadly, his wife developed a cancer. I'm not sure in which part of, uh, of, of the body. And uh, they suspended the life force of cancer cells using particular frequencies and uh, the colors of the earth and the yeah. colors of uh, the sun. But what happened in the 1960s was modern day pendulum dowsing became very popular where you use information dowsing, asking a question basically of a pendulum. And the, the knowledge of the earlier pendulum dowsing became unfashionable really because you've got to have a lot of training in it to tr train with these color frequencies but when i took people on tour to egypt a couple of weeks ago i trained uh people how to use and attune to the color frequencies of the earth temple space and the uh the isis pendulum and i'm really proud to say there were two physician doctors on the tour that are now going to be using this in their in their practices so again, we can take this ancient knowledge, yeah? We can take this ancient knowledge and say we can apply it to a modern generation and introduce it into our healing practices, as did our ancient ancestors. They were not just using earth energies to transport stones or things. They were using them as a healing modality with Pacific pendulum devices to enhance healing and their consciousness and that's part of my teachings in earth energies so on your workshop wow, uh, awesome. uh, people are going to learn how to uh do that too is that part of what you teach at the uh, contact in the desert a contact in the desert i'm going to be focusing on very positive earth energies that we can attune to and some of the more negative uh grids that uh, encompass the earth which we call geopathic stress now you can have all the healing in the world you could have the isis pendulum healing you could have chemotherapy you could have aromatherapy but if you go back home and your house is uh, suffering from geopathic stress by being on a, a grid line or a specific types of underground water you will not self-heal there was a test done in germany from the 1970s and 80s and 90s including 11 thousand houses that's not a small survey that's an intense survey and what the the doctor uh, found was that 
when you uh, live above geopathic stress, your body breaks down eventually with long term, you know, if you're above there for more than 10 years, for for example, or five years, your body uh, cells will become de- deficient uh, in some manner. And we call that geopathic stress. So I'm going to be teaching people how to live in harmony with the earth. Checking your house is not above geopathic stress because in that German report, it was found, and this is an amazing statistic, it was found categorically that a third of all hospital admissions between six months of their tests were down to geopathic stress. That's a third of all hospitals are down to where you live. Yeah. So if you start living in harmony wow. with with the earth, you are not having geopathic stress. Geopathic stress will uh, make your blood thicker. So you're more prone to a stroke or a heart attack. Now, in a modern day world, if you have a grid line that is geopathic stress going through your house and you've got your I think you call it a router. We call it a router. You have your TV on it. You're, you're adding to that. Do you see what I mean? You're adding to the electromagnetic effect of that grid line. So I'm going to be teaching at Contact in the Desert. How do you find these? And uh, I'm, I've been teaching this for, you know, half my life. <laughs> So I know how to train people very quickly, very effectively to live in harmony with the with the land. And then I can train people how to find positive earth energy and use that for for healing and, and empowering and expanding your your consciousness in a, in a spiritual way. And we need to live in harmony with the earth because if we don't we will become ill and in germany they called them cancer houses you would have one occupant going in there and becoming ill after five years they would move out another occupant comes in and they will get ill so it's really down to to where you live and our ancient ancestors when they looked at not just their stone circles let's move beyond the stone circles into their settlements their houses and their farms and uh uh, there where they lived they lived above harmonic earth energy off the negative grids or some of the more toxic uh, lays and uh, underground uh, water so they they lived to be uh, a long age and it's uh, literally an archaeological lie when they tell us that oh the ancient ancestors only lived to their age of 30 no they didn't you have lots of very mature old people that have been found and let's face it they lived on organic food no monsanto roundup spray there clean water they and they lived right. in harmony with the earth they were very healthy and very uh, functional so at contact in the desert i'm going to be training people up to become a uh, geomantic uh, experts within a small space of time keeping your families and your loved ones safe and living in harmony with gaia wow so if your house happens to be in one of these negative places is there any way to alleviate that or change it or or just move what's the answer the answer is very simple Uh, you find out where the lines or the energy flows through you get your electromagnetic uh, equipment like your tv your router etc off that and you put yourself into a neutral space now, you, you could spend a fortune on Organite, you could spend a fortune on uh, looking on the Internet and getting all these devices, but you just get yourself into a neutral zone. It's that that simple. And it was found in Germany that not just where you slept would affect your health, but when they looked at schools and how some stu- students can be disruptive or slow at learning and uh, uh, they realized that they too were on the grid, get a child off uh, into a neutral zone and they learn much, much, much faster. So some of the uh, German schools are laid out uh, in respect of uh focusing on a better education for for their children so we can literally once we understand some simple facts about the earth my goodness we can change our lives we really really can so that would be a wonderful service for someone to learn how to do that and help people build in the right place or buy in the right place that's that's incredible 
Well, well, exactly, and it will save your health, and and not just health. that. If you if not if you that. if you yeah, if you if you, if you live in harmony with the earth, uh, you you age more gracefully as well. Yes, I can see that. So, do certain people belong in certain places? Is there a way to resonate that correlate that that information? Because people are different in frequencies, right? Because we're Absolutely. You know, there's that whole theory that we we're, we're attracted to different places of where we're supposed to be born, and and then we're when we move into another place later in our life. There's like supposed to be three places in the world where your energy uh, resonates best. And I, I I had a reading one time. They said I'm from Pennsylvania, so they said I moved to the right place. I'm in Valley, but the third place could be Northern California. But um, what do you know about all that? Well, I would look at that through the earth energies and the color frequencies that the earth energies emit and how it relates, you know, to, to the sun, to, to where you are, because you can, once you have uh, an understanding of uh, earth energies, you can bring those earth energies into harmony with you. So I would, I would say that, you know, where, where you live, you can make that very, very harmonic. Yeah. By, by understanding mm-hmm. how to raise certain frequencies, maybe put another one down. You can get everything very bespoke to where you live in, in harmony with the occupants, not just you, but maybe your children or you, et cetera. You can get a whole property in, in harmony with the occupants. And then we, we see the, the house as being a living place with its own spirit of place. And you bring that into harmony with uh, with you uh, as well. So it, it's about kind of looking at something from lots of different perspectives to allow you to be in harmony with that energy. Amazing. Wow. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time. So tell us some, about yourself, how people can find you, a little bit more about your classes. We've got about three more minutes and then we're... We run out the clock. Take it away. Sure, you can find out about me through my website. My teaching website for uh, different subjects is esotericcollege.com. You can find out about my tours and my dowsing workshops at the Avebury Experience. Dot co dot uk that's a v e b u r y. You can email me at Maria Wheatley at aol.com and I'll, I'm always happy to uh, advise people uh, through uh, brief uh, emails and you can find out about my books I've written several books Divine in Ancient Sites The Essential Dowsing Guide a book on Avebury I'm writing a big book on Stonehenge I've written a book about the elongated skulls of Stonehenge which is my initial finds so you can find out all about my books and my websites Right, and then you're going to be at the Contact in the Desert. What dates are you doing what? Do you have that information on your workshops so people can look it up at yeah, contactinthedesert.com? Yeah, you can go to uh, contactinthedesert.com uh, and find out. I think I'm speaking on the Saturday, and I have uh, a workshop uh, later on in the in the afternoon, I think. And if you do come to contact in the desert and you do want to learn dowsing, please bring a dowsing rod or a pendulum with you because I cannot take in my luggage lots of dowsing rods. They think that I was a, probably a terrorist <laughs> coming over. So I'm, asking, <laughs> so I'm asking people to bring dowsing rods and pendulums uh, with them would be a, a wonderful thing. But I will have one, uh, a couple to share anyway. And, uh, and I'm going to get people dousing in America like you haven't seen dousing or earth energies. And I'm so looking forward to it. That sounds exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, are, are certain uh, people uh, better at dousing than others? Oh, go ahead, Tasha. You're fine. You take the final one. Oh, go uh, ahead. Uh, Janet is our CEO, but Janet, if you can get the bucks together, I want to go and, and take everything that Marie is teaching. I'm so turned on to this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> go over and uh, donate well. to Aquarium Radio so we can get Sasha over to contact in the desert. <laughs> Just, what, four weeks away. <laughs> 
you wow. need to come see Maria. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's been well, really you know, great I, talking to you both. You're both very knowledgeable, and uh, it's always great to be on a radio show where you know you, you you're with uh, very knowledgeable people. So thank you for your in-depth questions and exploring Earth energies with me. It's 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 great. Thanks. Thank yeah, you. thank you for coming on to our show. And uh, are you going to be uh, going anywhere else? You're staying in the UK or doing it? Oh, you're going to Ohio. Where, where else are you going to be on tour? Ohio, California? I'm going to, to New England, to America, Stonehenge and Gunji Wamp and some other ancient sites on October the 6th. You can find out more about that on my website, theaveryexperience.co.uk. Next year, I plan to be teaching in Ohio and doing the Anazazi Trail of Arizona. I want to bring the knowledge of Earth Energies over to uh, America and uh, switch you guys on to a more of an in-depth understanding about Earth Energies and loving your sights and loving your own ambiance of your Earth Energies there. You live in a beautiful country with some an- excellent ancient sites and and I will be uh, decoding those sites and telling you all about your Earth Energies in your landscape. Wonderful. We're looking forward to to hopefully we'll someday meet you and um, look up and find Maria on her tour and I'm waiting for the music I'm not sure why <laughs> anything it else had, you want to say Sash I'm not sure why it hadn't yeah. started but it should have started already I'll have to so you might as well just uh, we'll drop it okay my much love and blessings and aloha thank you everybody for joining us thank you Maria thank you Thomas Becker, thank you, Dr. Sasha.